Okay. Let's get started. <clears throat> okay, I guess this is our fourth lecture. And uh, before we start today, I just want to make a little comment about, you know, what we're studying right now. Because you may be wondering, you know, this is an analog circuits course, and we're doing a lot of modeling stuff. So if you are eager to get started with circuits, uh, I'm just going to say be a little bit patient. Uh, got some groundwork to do once we build a strong foundation, I think, later on the discussion will be a lot more uh, interesting and, and in-depth. So, yeah, it's taking a little bit longer than even I thought, but uh, hopefully by this lecture and, and next week we should wrap up all the kind of the modeling background elements uh, that, that are necessary for this course. Okay? Any questions or comments? Is it useful? Is it uh, too much of a review? Is it too fast? Anybody want to say anything about that? Okay, and in, in, uh, as you're thinking about that, let me make another comment. Uh, somebody mentioned that there is a uh, EE240 um, group, based a news group. Uh, is it a news group or is it a Google group? Do you, it's a news group, okay. So uh, he, he, the person who alerted me of this is a graduate student and uh, basically wanted to get a discussion going on there. Uh, so if you guys have questions or have solutions that you'd like to post, well, not solutions to the homework, but... <laughs> You know, if you have a you know solution to a, a bug with the simulator or something or a workaround, uh, I think that that is a good place to, to have a discussion, especially because I think there are communities of people in this class who are somewhat disconnected. You know, people on the circuit side, first-year graduate students, uh, and then people on the device side. So uh, and maybe on the CAD side. So there are disparate communities, and it is good to get communication going on on uh, between you guys. Okay. And uh, I'll, if there's, if the discussion's lively, I'll even show up and, and answer some questions. So, <laughs> um, homework is due today. The second homework has been posted. I think uh, you'll find the second homework assignment very, very reasonable, very easy, uh, a quickie uh, almost, uh, because of uh, what you've done in homework number one. So, uh, still get started early. Don't want to discourage you from starting early, but that'll be d uh, due in a week. Any other questions, comments? And also, thanks for showing up, guys. <laughs> I'm glad the room's not empty. So while doing the simulation and for the first homework, found, we found out that the output resistance of the PMOS is much higher than that of the NMOS. So is it a modeling defect? Or? I think it's both. I mean, the PMOS device uh, doesn't have impact ionization occurring at the same voltage. It would be a higher voltage because you need a higher field because uh, the higher uh, effective mass of holes than electrons. So that's somewhat realistic that the PMOS output resistance is higher at higher voltages. Yeah, that's that's the, because the effect of uh, impact ionization is not taken. Yeah. But even without that, also the like it's a or like two three times higher than even when we assume that only Dibble is playing a part or. At the interface of channel and modulation and dibble, still PMOS resistance is way higher. This lambda comes out to be much less than that of NMOS. Mm -hmm. so yeah, again, that that's somewhat realistic, but it shouldn't be so much higher. I mean, they, they would you would expect a factor of two or something like that, but not anything more. The other thing that that I noticed from the models is that uh, if you plot the the value of DC gain, the variation in DC gain is actually quite small over process. That's actually not so realistic. Uh, so if you got something that we may modify, we may put out a revision to the model to, to give you guys a more realistic model to work with. OK? So any kind of uh, comments, anything that you think is unphysical in the model, uh, come and tell me. I think we have some time to, to really you know iron out those issues so you have a really nice physical model to work with, especially when you do your project. All right, so let's uh, get back to uh, where we left off. I think this is exactly where we left off last lecture. We were discussing uh, the variation of mobility with the effective inversion layer, or more, more uh, intuitive, the, the effective vertical electric field. And we discussed why the mobility degrades at high fields and low fields. At high fields, the intuition is that the electrons or the holes are getting 
pulled closer to the surface where there's enhanced scattering due to the surface scattering states. And at low fields, because the inversion layer is disappearing, there's less screening. And so there's more Coulomb scattering occurring. OK? OK, uh, again, we're going to just go through fairly quickly and, and just make you aware of some of the concepts. And, and I I'll, I'll, won't go through too much detail. Uh, something that we're just going to sweep under the rug for the moment is just all quantum effects. And very generically, quantum effects, uh, you know, here's a plot. This, this blue curve is a plot of the electron density as we approach the surface. So, you know, x equals 0 here is the surface. And then as you go down, you can see that it's decaying very quickly down to very low, low values. So you would, if, if you saw this curve, you would say, yeah, most of the electrons are actually at the surface. Okay? Now that's solving Poisson's equation, just electrostatics. Well, if you take into the fact that uh, the surface state has different energy than a state, let's say, further from the surface, in other words, if you solve Schrodinger's equation with a potential well, then you would actually get this solution. And this solution shows that the peak in the charge density is actually not at the surface. It's, a, it's away from the surface, right? And this peak will move around a little bit as you change the value of the electric field, because you're changing the boundary conditions over which you're solving this problem. Okay? So now that has an important impact. Uh, one place will, will your, will, where you'll see that is uh, in the CV curve, right? Because now it looks like your oxide has two components, a component which is here, which is the silicon dioxide. And then there's also this region, you know, you can think of effectively as being another oxide, which is inside the silicon, right? In other words, the current is conducting right below the surface, not at the surface. Another place where you see this is in the gate material. So the gate is not, again, it's not a perfect uh, metal. It's a piece of polysilicon. And, uh, if you actually again solve the you know solve the equations, you find that the peak charge density again does not occur at the bottom surface. It occurs a little bit away from the bottom. In fact, the bottom surface is depleted of charge of free carriers. We call this polysilicon depletion. Okay, and so we see the combined effect uh, of of these two quantum effects: depletion in the in the um, material and depletion at the surface makes our device. Uh, less powerful, if you will, because you know the power of a transistor is kind of given by how much gate drive you have, how big C ox is, and both of these effects tend to reduce C ox, which is a bad thing. Now, why is it that we don't notice this in long channel transistors? Well, it's very obvious in a long transistor, long channel transistor, the the oxide is quite thick, and so a few angstroms here and there, you know, it's it's in the noise, nobody notices it. But when you build a transistor that's very short channel and has a very thin oxide, then you start to notice these effects. Okay? And in fact, uh, is there a question? Is this because of a boundary condition that we put ourselves, or is it, does it come out of the equation when you solve the Schrodinger's equation? It comes out of the equation. So if you solve Schrodinger's equation and Poisson's equation, you find that the charge. How can we solve the equation in a boundary when it's too? We have two materials. I mean, it doesn't give the answer to that in the boundary. You have to specify the number of electrons at the boundary and then solve the equation for the rest. Well, the, the boundary condition is that there's a potential where, well, so charges can't freely move between there. Yeah, that's the boundary condition, yeah. You specify the potential at that position. Yeah. The, the solution is also very approximate. So if you if you take in quantum mechanics, if you charge for, if you solve for uh, the energy states of an electron in a potential well. It's a very similar kind of calculation. All right. So the, the place you would see this, you know, in, is in measurements. So if you go and measure the CV curve of a device, uh, we talked about this, I think, in the first lecture or second lecture. Uh, you know, this is the classical CV curve where once you hit inversion, very quickly the capacitance approaches W times L times C ox, right? And uh, if you approach accumulation, the same thing would happen. But in a real measured device, you get these circles. These are, these are actual measured points. Uh, this is from uh, Bob Dutton's group at Stanford. And you can see that uh, there's two combined effects which are giving rise to this. One is the polydepletion, which we talked about. As we increase the gate voltage, the depletion region thickness increases. And so the capacitance gets smaller and smaller. 
and then also the quantum effects, which lower this even further. Okay. Questions? Okay, uh, another thing that we, we touched upon uh, last lecture was just the non-uniform doping in, in our device. And this is kind of a cartoon diagram which shows you what the various doping regions look like. So you have your, uh, your substrate, you have your P-well, and then you have your source drain extension dopings, you have your halo implants, uh, pocket implants, the uh, silicidation which we talked about on the gate material and on the source and drain. And the fact that the doping is, is non-uniform uh, really gives rise to all, all the geometry-dependent effects because most notably as we change the channel length of the device, the effective amount of doping uh, in the channel changes, especially as these halo implants and source strain extensions become an appreciable fraction of what's really the channel. We know in reality that these doping profiles aren't step profiles, right? There's a gradual change in doping as we leave one region and enter another region. And so really the channel, the effect of doping in the channel is, is, is quite complicated. All right, so let's now switch a little bit and uh, talk ab about the regions of operation of the transistor, uh, most notably uh, the, the subthreshold region or the weak inversion region. Uh, well, we all know that uh, you know, the square law says that below threshold voltage current is zero. Of course, the current's not equal to zero if you actually go and measure it. It's small, but it's appreciable and uh, it actually increases exponentially. And the easiest way to see that is to plot the drain current versus VGS on a log scale, right? And you guys all did this for your homework. And you see that there's a very large range over which the current responds exponentially, you know, several orders of magnitude, one, two, three, four, five, six, and just shown in this plot, uh, over which there's an exponential relationship between the drain current and the gate source voltage. And of course, that's a lot like a bipolar transistor. So first of all, uh, why is it like a bipolar transistor? And second of all, you know, can we use this region? What are, what are some of the properties of this region? Okay, well, the way that uh, weak inversion models are derived are, are very much opposite to the way a strong inversion model is derived. So a strong inversion model, we assume that all the currents are drift currents, right? In a weak inversion model, we assume that you know, the, the amount of drift currents is really small. Most of the currents are actually diffusion currents, okay? So it's another, another extreme model, right? So it's not going to really be able to predict what happens in this transition region, but certainly in this region here, hopefully we'll be able to have a good model. Um, so if you actually look at what that means, uh, because, you know, there, there's there's certainly charges in the channel. So if there's no drift currents, that means effectively there's no field. There's no lateral field, which means the potential is, is more or less constant along the channel, right? That's what it all works out, out to. Um, now the, and don't, don't bother reading all this. Uh, you can read it later. Uh, I think I'd like to just show you a picture. And this picture should look very familiar to you. This picture is just kind of the, the potential profile in a, in a bipolar transistor, right? And if you think about it, uh, it's, it, this MOSFET device looks a lot like a bipolar transistor. You have an NPN junction, right, source. In this case, I've drawn it as a PNP. You have a source, a base, <coughs> uh, the source, the channel, and the drain, which are acting like the emitter, the base, and the collector. And there's an initial potential barrier, or let's say the hill, for holes to get injected into the channel. Once they're in the channel, they diffuse across, and some fraction of those uh, carriers will make it to the drain where they fall into the drain, let's say through this waterfall, right? And uh, so the question is, you know, where's the base contact, right? And, you know, the gate is, is insulated from the, the channel, right? And there's a substrate contact or body contact. Uh, so potentially, you know, the body contact could act like the base, but in fact, it turns out that the gate is more important because it's closer to the surface. Even though it doesn't make contact with the surface, it can in field induce uh, different potentials in the channel uh, in a stronger fashion than the body contact. And so this is the argument here. 
is even though I'm not DC coupled to the channel, I'm very strongly AC coupled to the channel, right? So if I change my gate voltage, there's a capacitive divider. You draw a simple picture. So this is my C depletion, and then this is my C aux. This is exaggerated, obviously. So this is my gate contact. So if I change this gate, the surface potential will change almost linearly with this gate voltage, right? If this model were valid, it would change linearly. And so I would say that um, the channel, the change in the channel potential is equal to C aux over C aux plus C depletion delta V gate, right? Just by this capacitive divider. Or if I define an N factor, I can just say that the change of the gate gets attenuated by this N factor, where N is 1 plus C depletion over C aux. Okay? And you can see that as C aux approaches infinity, N approaches 1. So for a good transistor, N would in fact approach 1 because we would have very strong gate control. Okay? Incidentally, if you just plug in what C depletion is and what C aux is, uh, because they have they operate over approximately the same area, W times L, then C depletion would be epsilon silicon over the depletion region width, and C aux would be T aux over the silicon dioxide uh, epsilon. And so you can basically calculate this at a given bias voltage and figure out what the real N value is. So this is the only thing that varies with bias. Now, a lot of times, this variation is small. So we just, again, make an approximation that n is roughly constant. We calculate it at a given, at a given point and, uh, and uh, just use that value. OK, so now you can, uh, yes, question. I understand it's a model, but I'm just curious. Where did the base current go? I think it's DC. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's it's actually going to be the body contact, right? So the substrate current will be the base current. You see the current flow off on body when. Oh yeah, you... definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. Because it is a bipolar transistor, right? It has a finite value of beta, right? It, there's got to be a substrate current. Now, if you remember where the substrate current comes from. Uh, the base current comes from. Part of it is the reverse injection, right? And the other part of it is due to um, um, holes in electrons basically, you know, annihilating each other. So if you have a, you know, if the doping profiles are going to be very favorable here. There's going to be much higher doping for the injection rather than for the reverse injection. Okay, so now this picture uh, makes a little bit more sense. Uh, we switch to the computer. And so now we can see that this completes this picture that uh, basically we're modulating the channel potential, which is roughly constant, through our gate voltage. And once you accept this, then you could probably almost write down this equation, right? You would say, okay, I know that the current is going to be exponential, right? Uh, it's the only exception is that the VGS minus T is going to get divided by N, right? And uh, all this action occurs around threshold, so I've kind of artificially centered the model around the threshold voltage. That's kind of arbitrary. I could take this out and absorb it in this constant uh, if you don't like it there. Uh, this is also, uh, this equation almost looks exactly like the ebers mole equation for large signal behavior of bipolar transistors. So all this part of it is very understandable. Um, the dependence on W and L also is, is understandable. As we scale the width, of course, the current goes up. And as you'll remember, in a bipolar transistor, uh, if there's only diffusion current flowing and the current is constant, that means that the basically electron distribution is, is a triangular function in the base region, right, or in the channel region, right? It's a uniformly decreasing. And as you change the L, you change the slope. And so the current should be proportional to 1 over the base width 
which in this case works out to be the channel length. And so you get this equation. Um, again, we're not deriving this equation uh, you know, in detail. We're just kind of saying, yeah, this is reasonable. And if you're interested, of course, you can look it up in your, in your, in your textbook. Uh, Savitas' book has a nice derivation of several versions of this equation, starting out with different assumptions. So from our perspective, this is what we're going to kind of walk away with, uh, with, with weak inversion. Uh, first of all, you know, this is one reason why we study bipolar transistors, right? I've actually had a lot of students come up to me uh, in classes saying, why are you teaching us bipolar, right? Nobody cares about bipolar anymore. Well, bipolar behavior, if you will, uh, no pun intended, is actually fair right it happens a lot you know you basically it's physics it's basically it's Boltzmann statistics it's going to appear everywhere you have junctions everywhere you know diodes transistors they just appear right you can't help it and so by studying bipolar transistors we're going to understand these parasitic behaviors uh, but actually weak inversion is not you know you don't have to think about it as a parasitic behavior you can think of it as something very beneficial because that exponential behavior gives us a large GM and GM is good, right? And the fact that the currents are low means low power. So in some ways, weak inversion seems like a great solution to a whole host of problems, namely problems where speed is not as important. Classic example would be like your watch, right? Your watch doesn't need to run at 3 gigahertz, right? <laughs> it's keeping time on a second scale. Yeah, weak inversion is a good choice. Uh, sensor networks, if you're deploying a network and you can't change the batteries, you want to have some battery lifetime of let's say 10 years and you want to charge with solar power, yeah, your current's going to be very limited. And so operation and weak conversion is going to be a very good choice, especially if speed is not a concern. Okay. So the other thing that uh, we walk away with is that uh, the only difference between this weak conversion and, uh, and true bipolar behavior is namely this N factor here, that we don't have a perfect, uh, you know, 60 millivolts per decade relationship. In fact, that relationship is altered by this N factor. And roughly for our device, the N factor works out to be about one and a half. Now, we'll come back to this point, but the thing you should really always remember is that weak inversion is very slow, right? It's like a dog. Uh, you have very large CGS and very little current drive. And so designing high speed circuits is just not possible, right? Uh, the other nice thing, though, is that you don't have to go all the way to weak conversion. You can go to what we call moderate inversion. And uh, moderate inversion kind of is a trade-off. It, it's operation in this region here. Now, the bad thing about moderate inversion is that we don't have good models for it. Right? We have good weak inversion models. We have good strong inversion models. But moderate inversion is just too complicated, so we don't have good models for it. Um, but it's actually a very good trade-off point to operate if you're trading off between speed and uh, performance. Uh, the other issue with, with weak inversion, uh, which we'll talk about when we talk about current sources, is the threshold mismatch that you get in a transistor uh, really can be a big problem because the currents are exponentially proportional to voltages. And so a small mismatch in threshold between two transistors means their currents are going to be way off. And uh, that means that if we're trying to design precision mirrors, we're going to end up with really gross errors. And so this is something that we'll have to talk about later. OK, so again, just to reiterate, moderate inversion is operation in between weak and strong inversion. And uh, what the, the most important thing is that both drift currents and diffusion currents are actually an important contribution to the total current. You can't neglect one or the other. And as I just said, that means we don't have closed form equations to represent this region. Um, so how do we actually model this region? Well, if you're using a good model that uh, is, is quite accurate, then it would basically be something like a surface potential model. And uh, if that makes sense to you, then you probably know what I'm talking about. If it doesn't, we can talk about it offline. But models that are basically complete, they actually use the surface potential to describe the IV, QV characteristics of a transistor, very easily can automatically take into account the moderate inversion region. 
Uh, there's also models that uh, aren't quite as accurate as, as surface potential models, but still can can get this modern inversion region. But again, they're a little bit beyond what I would call hand calculation models, right? They're a little bit too complicated to use by hand, but they're good for computer simulation. Um, so one, one solution that uh, people have come up with are these so-called patching models or smoothing functions. And the idea is that I have a good model for weak inversion, I have a good model for strong inversion, I know everything should be pretty physical, so there should be kind of a smooth curve between fitting everything, right? So why not just say, yeah, this region in between, yeah, I'll just use some smoothing functions to make sure that I pass through this region smoothly, and that should be pretty close. Actually, it turns out that that's pretty good. It works pretty well. Um, in fact, BSIM 3.3 does something like that. Uh, it, it has exactly something like this occurring inside the model where it smoothly takes you from one region to the other. And a popular smoothing function is this log 1 plus x squared function uh, that I've shown you here. The idea behind this function is that let's say the exponential term dominates, right? Then I can neglect this 1 and ln of e of x is just x and so I get x squared. And so you can think of x squared as being our strong inversion region, right? I've now modeled my strong inversion uh, region operation. So this would be something like VGST. On the other hand, <clears throat> if exponential term is very small, I can do Taylor series expansion on it and just keep, the, let's say, the linear term. And then I can do a, a Taylor series expansion of ln of 1 plus x, which is roughly x. And that gives me uh, basically uh, my weak inversion region of operation. So actually this is kind of bad notation here. I should have called this y because y is e to the x, right? Sorry, I, I misspoke earlier when I said <clears throat> you tailor expand e to the x. You don't tailor x series expand e to the x. So this is, think of this as y, but y is small. So ln of 1 plus y is y, which is e to the x, which gives us our weak inversion region. Any questions? All right, and uh, just very quickly, uh, I'll talk about the BSIM model because we're using it in this class. Um, as you probably know, it's an industry standard model, so if you go to a company, uh, you'll be happy to see the word Berkeley popping up every day uh, because almost everybody uses the BSIM models to do circuit simulation. And the B in BSIM does stand for Berkeley. Uh, it's the Berkeley short channel ICFET model. Uh, ICFET being another name for a, a MOSFET, insulated gate uh, FET, an older term. Uh, it's good to know those ol older terms because they, they come in handy, right, when you're trying to come up with an acronym. Uh, so one of the issues with, with BSIM is that there's lots of parameters, right? There's something like 10 or 15 parameters that you'll recognize. You'll say, oh, yeah, that's mobility. Oh, yeah, that's TOX. And then there's all these parameters which are kind of mysterious. And depending on how you extract the model card, it could be 40 parameters, it could be 100 parameters. And uh, not only do you have to read the BESA manual, which is, you know, 60, 70 pages to understand. I mean, 60, 70 pages are just equations, not really explanations. Uh, then you have to go get a book that describes those equations to understand why those equations were are in the form that they are. And so then... Uh, you say, okay, now I understand the equations. Now I, you know, understand the the modeling behind them. Well, how do I extract a model, right? I have a transistor in the lab. I need these 50, 60 parameters. How do I do that? Well, it's not easy, actually. If you try to do it yourself without any help, you might spend a month in the lab just, you know, pulling your hair out because all these parameters, some of them are correlated. So you change one, it fixes one thing, but then everything else gets messed up. And so obviously you realize this is a good problem for a computer to handle. And so you go spend a lot of money and you buy software that you push a button and it does the optimization for you and gives you all the parameters. Even so, uh, the people who extract these models who work with the software are kind of like extraction engineers. You know, they're engineers, right? They're not technicians. And they, um, they might spend several hours or several days extracting model for one transistor. So it's, it's quite complicated. Um, BSIM-3, which what we're using in this class, is uh, has most of the physics that we want. Uh, 
Uh, BSIM 4, which is an you know which is the next version of the model, has some more enhancements, has a better noise model in particular, has a much better thermal noise model, uh, inc includes the gate-induced noise, uh, it has a substrate network, and it also models gate current, which is increasingly becoming important. In BSIM 3, there is no gate current; the gate is a good insulator. In BSIM 4, the tunneling currents that go through the gate are actually modeled. Okay. Um, <coughs> So when I when I first actually came to Berkeley, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to put together like a hand model, something that you could actually use for design. And so we talked to the Beeson people, and you know uh, we came up with this. Hey, let's let's just take Beeson three, strip it down, and see what we get. So we called this the Beeson hand calculation models. Something you know if you're on an airplane and you don't have your computer, you could sit down and write down a few equations and design the next best oscillator or something. Um, unfortunately, um, I'll just, before I get your hopes up, I'll say that the <laughs> we, we kind of failed. I don't think we really came up with a good model. And I, I think this is still a very interesting research problem. So I put it out there to you guys. If you are interested, uh, this is a great, this is a nice way to have impact on, on the whole analog industry is come up with a model that you can actually use to do hand calculations. So here's here's one version of that, which is really strongly motivated by BSIM-3 equations. So what we do is uh, you assume that the threshold voltage is given, okay? Uh, that you're operating only in strong inversion. This is definitely one of the biggest weaknesses of this model because we've just talked about how modern inversion is is very important for analog design. Uh, we use uh, we try to take into account the mobility reduction mechanisms due to lateral and vertical fields. And that's uh, really equivalent to using the mobility model 2 from BSIM. We neglect the effect of bulk charges. In other words, this we assume that n factor is constant. Or more equivalently, if you remember from last lecture, we assume threshold voltage doesn't vary as you move along the channel, right? That the, the effect of the bulk charges are negligible on the threshold voltage. And then finally, again, probably the second biggest weakness of the model is that the R out model is quite simple. We just assume the channel length modulation dominates the output resistance of the device. So here are some definitions. This is a, a mobility degradation coefficient that we're going to use, critical field for velocity saturation. Again, I'll, I'll let you guys look at this in detail if you're interested. Uh, so again, here are the equations. Uh, you define, this is your new value of VDSAT, so it's not just VGST. It includes the effects of mobility degradation in it. And it turns out that in for linear and saturation region, you can express the currents with the long channel values, the ones that you know and love, multiplied by these mobility uh, degradation coefficients. So this is taken into account both the degradation and mobility due to the vertical fields and lateral fields. Um, so these, these equations aren't too bad, right? I mean, this is kind of nasty here, these right-hand sides, but well, okay, it's not too bad. Uh, this is what your GM ends up looking like. Uh, again, it's very close to the, what you would expect. There's this term here that looks familiar. I think there might be a factor of two missing here. Uh, and then there's this term here. Here's the R out. Pretty ugly, right? I wouldn't really rem remember this if I were on an airplane. Uh, so, you know, how does this do? If you if you look at the IV curves. Uh, they look okay, right? They don't look terrible. You can pretty closely replicate the IV curves in strong inversion. But if you show this to a modeling expert, they would say, no, this is terrible. Why is that? Yeah, it maybe looks like there's a few percent error at most, right? Why would you, in, in strong inversion, why would you not like this? What's wrong? Um, yeah, that's not great, but again, it sits within a few percent, right, 5% or something. I mean, we know process variations are going to be 20%, so why am I worried about... Yeah, what about the weak inversion? Weak okay, well, admittedly, we, we said this is a strong inversion model, right? Don't use it in weak inversion. I'll think about as an analog circuit designer, what do you care about, right? Do you care about these IV curves so much? 
What do you care about? Someone's shaking their head. So what do you, what do you care about? The slopes. Exactly. That's very good. The slopes, right? That's what determines our GM and our RO for our device. And you can see that the slopes are actually really off. If you go in and, and look at this carefully, very small, like a few percent error in the IV curves could translate into 50, 60 percent error in your slopes. And that's terrible because that the slope is what your gain is, it, where your gain is coming from. And so here is, 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 here it is. This is the GM and this is the R out. And uh, you can see that uh, the hand calculation model for GM uh, versus basically some of the full BSIM models, you can see there's a pretty big deviation in these regions here. Um, output resistance, well, you know, we knew that we weren't going to really get a good match to output resistance. It's just too complicated. All right, so just a summary on this hand cap model is that pretty much don't use it. It's, it's not very good. Uh, it's, it's you know, a little bit better than the, the strong inversion model, but, but really not much. What we're going to do in this class is we're going to learn to rely on the simulator as a design tool. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we're just going to spice everything. We're not going to do any calculations. We're going to use the simulator to do these large signal stuff that we're not good at doing by hand. But the actual design, which is mostly small signal design, will be done by hand. Okay, and and we'll do an example of that, uh, hopefully by the end of the, today's class. Okay, I already talked about these uh, other more advanced models that are available. Uh, just to give you some names, uh, you may hear the term EKV. Uh, EKV comes from Europe. It's a very popular model uh, for analog design, especially for weak inversion, modern inversion operation. Um, it's a charge-based model. I won't go into much detail uh, in this class. It's not really the place. Uh, there's also these so-called next-generation models, which really turn out to be most of them are surface potential models. Uh, and you know, very going back to a comment I made in the very first lecture. Whenever somebody says I have a physical model, you always should take that with a grain of salt because it turns out, yeah, the transistor is pretty complicated, right? If you if you want to be humbled go try to model this little tiny transistor. It looks so simple, right? Four terminal device. 100 pages later of equations, you realize that, you know, there's a lot of physics in there. So anytime anyone says they have a physical model, you should really take that with a grain of salt. In this particular case, it's a physical model for a long channel transistor. Okay. Well, we don't use long channel transistors, right? So what does that mean? Um, well, some of these models that are out there, probably the I would say one of the best ones out there, uh, the best two, let's say, are MOS11 and HiSIM. And in fact, there is a big uh, competition between these two models to become the, the next generation standardized model. Uh, HiSIM comes from Japan. I think the HI stands for Hiroshima University. Uh, MOS11 comes from Philips. Uh, it's there. It's it's probably I you know my personal bias is that. Well, I won't say. Uh, <laughs> I always have to remember I'm being recorded. Both, both are pretty good models. Well, the, the, the modeling community decided that uh, they liked what's called uh, PSP. And PSP is a merger of MOS11 and SP. SP is a university model like BSIM. It's from uh, Pennsylvania State University. Um, so PSP is going to be the next generation standardized model, and it's probably in a couple years, when you guys are out working in industry, you, you probably will start to hear people talking about PSP. Okay. So, what do you think about BSIM? Is BSIM dead in the future? Uh, no, actually, you know, the, there's so much infrastructure around BSIM. You know, it, it, the, the reason that models live a lot longer than you would imagine. I mean, when I came to Berkeley four years ago, you know, BSIM 4 was fully released and uh, you know, widely available. And yet nobody was using it. You know, if you went into the foundries, they'd give you BSIM 3 models. And the reason is that it takes a long time to take a model from code to actual implementation and, and, and application. Part of that is that, you know, designers are very conservative. They're not going to just switch models. They want a few years to pass the model to be tested to make sure there's no weird effects in there. The other is just know-how. You know, people are experts at extracting BSIM 3 models. You give them a new model, they say no. I don't know how to do that model. I'm going to wait and, until I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like to be, I'm an expert at BSIM 3. I, I know how to extract it. Saves me time. 
you know, what am I going to get if I use BSIM 4? I'm only going to use it if I there's a feature in there that I absolutely need. And it turned out that the features that were in BSIM 4, gate current, substrate resistance, were things that you could just tack on to BSIM 3 with sub-circuits. And so that's why BSIM 3 lived for so long. Um, probably the biggest issue is implementation of simulators. So these models, there, there's many, many different versions of them. I keep saying BSIM 3, but there's hundreds of releases of BSIM 3. So you have to make sure that the release that you, you know, that you have from the foundry is the same as what's implemented in the, in the simulator. And very often, I remember a couple years ago, we did a project uh, using BSIM 4, and we found that one simulator was giving a completely different answer than another simulator because they hadn't been tested. So these are the reasons why people are, are hesitant to adopt a new model. It takes so long to take the equations and turn them into models that are run efficiently and numerically in a stable way that there's a, a lot of hesitation. Uh, so in some ways, you could say that you know now is the time for BSIM-4. You start to see 90 nanometer really being deployed with BSIM-4. And probably for the near foreseeable future, BSIM-4 will be the more popular model. OK, this, we, could, we could talk about this a lot. I'll, We'll talk about it more offline if you're interested. Uh, OK, so that's kind of our whirlwind run through uh, with kind of the large signal behavior of a transistor. But really, in this class, we care more about small signal behavior, right? We're designing linear circuits. And so it's really those GMs and those capacitances that, that are more important to us. So let's switch gears now and, and talk about small signal models. OK, so we just said it. SPICE, it's too complicated. We'll use it for verification, uh, but we're not going to use it for analysis. Uh, square law models, we talked about, they're just too simple. They don't capture enough. So we really, you know, we may rely on them for intuition, but we can't use them for design. OK? So really, a lot of the complexity of designing an integrated circuit for analog comes from this very fact that you have these complicated models and you don't want to just design with a simulator. You want to do some hand design. So what we want to do is find the right balance between using the simulator and using kind of hand analysis. The other important thing that uh, we talked about in the second lecture was device variations. Uh, we have to be aware that we're not always going to get the same device, right? The model card represents the average device, right? Or a corner device, a worst case device. In reality, every device we get is going to be different. Doping variations you know, are, for instance, uh, thicknesses. The metal widths are going to be different. At the end of the day, that means our threshold voltage is going to be vary. Our oxide capacitance is going to vary. Our mobility is going to vary, and so on and so forth. Um, so the way that we, we are handling that in this class is we have corner models, fast corner, slow corner, typical corner. And uh, so we have to make sure that over all process corners and over all temperatures, our circuits still work. You know, that, that's a little bit inconvenient to do that every time, but it's it's a reality. We have to do it. And probably, as I mentioned, in the near future, this is going to shift to statistical design, where we'll just be running lots of Monte Carlos. OK, so I'm going to run through fa fairly quickly here, and because you guys, this is pretty much homework number one. So this is something you did for homework number one. You looked at how the threshold voltage varied as you changed the channel length of the device. And you can see that this. Uh, Dependence is different for, let's say, PMOS and NMOS device. And you see you know, quite a bit of variation as you go over process corners. So up to 100 millivolts different uh, as you go from one process corner to another. And you can see that over channel length, the threshold voltage also varies close to 100 millivolts for this PMOS device. Uh, very similar for the NMOS device. Uh, the other things that you have to keep in mind is uh, not only does the threshold vary with process, but it also could vary with right body effect. And you guys all know this, so uh, that's pretty trivial. Um, even though the run-to-run -run variations are so large, right? We've seen up to 100 millivolts variation uh, in this uh, particular run process. Uh, it's actually not that bad, right? If you had to design with circuits where the VT was varying 100 millivolts from device to device, you'd be dead, right? Nothing would work. Luckily, as we talked about, transistors that are close by 
have much closer, much less variation in their threshold voltage. So the relative threshold voltage may only change a couple millivolts. It's the absolute value of threshold that varies a lot. So what we have to do is design circuits that are independent of the absolute value of threshold. We really want to go try to, you know, design circuits that vary more on the relative properties of VT. Um, I think we've seen, said most of this stuff. Um, I guess I'll just reiterate here that these, is there a question? Okay, so the, the large signal properties of a transistor, you know, let's say these BSIM equations, you know, they're very, they're important, right? They tell us how much current we're going to have. They tell us how much swing we're going to have. But once we know a particular operating point, it's really the small signal parameters are important. So really what we need to do is come up with a way of calculating our GMs, our capacitances, and our resistances in an accurate way and then we're done. We basically don't have to rely on these hundreds of equations. Okay, so again, this is a review for most of you. So, you know, transconductances at low frequencies are what really a transistor is all about. You know, for any given variation of voltages, if you, the variations are small enough, right, we do a Taylor series expansion, and we can say that the current varies linearly with, let's say, VGS. That's our transconductance linearly with VBS, that's our backgate transconductance, and linearly with VDS, and that's the GDS of the device, or one over that is the output resistance of the device. Okay? And so using the small signal, uh, using the square law model, for instance, we all know uh, we have some values for GM uh, in, in triode and in saturation. Uh, again, it's good to use these equations for intuition, not really for design. So for intuition, for instance, I can say, okay, well, here's, you know, here's one equation for GM. It's proportional to square root of ID. So I know roughly if I change ID by a factor of four, my uh, GM is going to improve roughly by a factor of two, right? So this is important intuition to have. Other, if you play with the equations, another form that that's really important, I think probably the most important for this class is, you can represent GM as a ratio between the DC current through the device and the VGST, okay, or the overdrive voltage, or the VDSAT. Pick your favorite uh, notation. In fact, if that's not enough, we'll come up with another one today. Uh, so this is really important, and we'll see why. This is actually a very important uh, concept. One of the reasons you might like it is that it looks a lot like a bipolar transistor, right? For a bipolar transistor, the GM is DC current divided by KT over Q, a fixed number, 25 millivolts at room temperature. Well, VDSAT is usually larger than 25 millivolts, right? It's a few hundred millivolts. So right off the bat, we can see that for the same current, you're always going to get a more GM out of a, a bipolar transistor than you will out of a FET. And in fact, here is the weakened version GM, right? Because the device is exponential, it looks a lot like a bipolar transistor. The GM is proportional to current, right, and inversely proportional to 1 over n, where n is this capacitor-divider ratio that we just talked about. So you can see that even in, in weak inversion, a, a, a MOSFET is not as good as a bipolar because n is bigger than 1, right? For our process, n is 1.5. Um, for digital applications, N is also important because it uh, determines your subthreshold swing, right? How quickly you can turn off your device and lower the current. And, you know, weak conversion represents kind of leakage in a digital circuit. All right, so if we, again, plot the GM of our device, um, let's say versus VGS, and I think you guys did this for homework as well, you can see that on a linear scale, there's a place where it's approximately linear, right? And that's kind of predicted by our square law model. But then the GM really starts to decrease, flattens out for larger values of VGS. And uh, what's happening is, actually, this is not velocity saturation. This should be uh, gate-induced mobility reduction. So what, what's happening is that as the VGS gets larger and larger, right, the carriers are getting pu pulled close to the surface, the mobility is decreasing. So as mobility decreases as a function of VGS, so does the GM. 
if we plot this on a log scale, yes. Yeah, but uh, there is some possibility that uh, the velocity saturation will happen either before the you know, the mobility decrease or after, you know. <clears throat> Could you comment on that? Yeah, that's a good point. So it, it depends. So if you, depends on how you measure the GM, right? So if you're, yeah, that, that is actually reasonable. Yeah, if you have a large current going through that device, then it is very likely, right, depending on what the drain voltage is. Uh, so if, yeah, it, it's it de again. It would depend on the drain voltage. Yeah, where this velocity saturation would would occur. Yeah. Okay, and uh, as you would expect, if you plot this on a log scale, you'll see that the GM is actually linear in weak inversion region, and so clearly the boundary of the weak inversion region is determined. You know, r right around the threshold voltage. Below that, it's more or less linear, and you have yourself a uh, bipolar-like behavior with this 1 over n factor. Okay, any other questions? All right, so as we commented, uh, if we put the GM of the FET device into this form, it looks a lot like a bipolar device. And in fact, uh, usually, you know, art, you know, you know that VDSAT has to be relatively large, right? 100 millivolts or larger. And and this is precisely the reason why it needs to be large, right? Because if I make VDSAT too small, I go into weak inversion, right? So you can see that this equation here, which is derived in strong inversion, uh, kind of approaches this equation as VDSAT becomes small, right? With this factor of 2 error. Obviously, it's not going to predict the right answer. It's a strong inversion model. But there is some some guidance here that you can't make VDSAT too small because then it really starts to look like a bipolar device. All right, and then just to uh, remind you guys again, I'll say this a lot just so you don't forget. You know, why is it this weak inversion is bad? It's the FT of the device, right? That's where the speed of the device is just way too slow for for high speed applications. So. If speed is not a concern, we can do it. Uh, but most of the time, speed is a concern, and we can't go all the way into weak inversion. Now, just one, one more comment about the speed. You know, if you go out and design in 90 nanometer and 65 nanometer, you may find actually that all of a sudden the FT in weak inversion is not all that bad, right? All of a sudden, you may get FTs on the order of gigahertz or more then you really have to rethink your design, right? Do I go weak inversion, modern inversion, or strong inversion? Uh, a lot of the these slides were probably created when the FT and weak inversion was, you know, 50 megahertz. And, you know, it was just basically, okay, no, I can't use it. But, yeah, the situation is changing. So, in particular, when you do your project this year, uh, this is something to think about. Is when does it make sense to operate in weak inversion? Okay, uh, in, in homework, I also asked you guys to plot uh, mu C ox, so this curve looks familiar to you guys. And uh, the, the point of this curve is to just show you that it's kind of a meaningless parameter, right? It's a long channel parameter. Uh, if, if, if square law model were valid, this would be constant, right? But you can see that it varies as you change, let's say, the current. So on the x-axis here, change the current in the device, and I plot the ratio of gm squared over 2 W over L I D, uh, which is again a long channel equation, and you can see that uh, you know it drops considerably. Uh, this is due to weak inversion over here, and for large values of current, it drops because of the mobility reduction. And uh, you can see that for a short channel device, the variation is much larger than a long channel device. For a long channel device, yeah, it's almost flat in this region, right? It's going down a little bit because of mobility reduction. Um, and this is for NMOS and PMOS device. Questions or comments? Yeah, this is basically just an uh, approximation because you know that squared out doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, the point of this slide is just to say don't use MUSIOX for design. It's not a good parameter. It's not constant. So uh, a lot of, uh, you know, so some of you misinterpreted the homework. 
that's okay, it's, it's a good exercise, and thought that you should derive equivalent parameters like mu and, and let's say tox and, and try to fit those to the, the real device behavior. Uh, that's fine if you did that. It actually would be interesting to, to see your homework and how much success you had. But the upshot is that it's, it's going to be pretty tough using s standard square law model without mobility reduction. If you put in mobility reduction, you can probably do a pretty decent job if you exclude a weak inversion. All right, so this is another thing you plotted for your homework, and uh, it's basically the ratio of GM over I. And uh, based on what we just talked about, we know that in strong inversion or under a square law model, GM over I kind of goes like 2 over VD sat, right? And uh, so if I plot this versus VGST, you would, you would expect that there would be a, a region where square law would be valid and the curve curvature would be described by this equation, kind of like a 1 over x equation. Um, we also know that in weak inversion, GM over I is a constant, right? Because GM is proportional to current. And the constant of proportionality is 1 over KT over Q times 1 over N. And we said that for our device, N was roughly 1 and a half. For bipolar device, of course, N is 1, right? If you're not, uh, if you're operating the device in the right region. And that means that this curve is bounded by 40, right? 1 over 25 millivolts is roughly 40. And so if you ever plot this curve and it goes above 40, you know there's something wrong, right? <laughs> um, so this curve is, is very important. And uh, it, the reason it's, it's important is it tells us, you know, in some ways the transconductance of the device is its most important property. It, you know, it's really why we use a transistor, right? And this is telling us how efficiently we can get transconductance out of our device. Okay? Well, this curve is saying weak inversion is the best region for that, right? Device is exponential. For a given amount of current, you get the most gain. And that's actually right. If transconductance were the only issue, then clearly operating in weak inversion is the best place to operate. It gives you the best bang for your buck, if you like. Uh, and strong inversion is terrible, terribly inefficient, right? You have to pump in a lot of current to get GM. And so it's only, again, when you need speed that you should do that to yourself, right? Uh, if you also plot the, the GM over I for NMOS and PMOS, you see the qualitative shape is pretty similar. They're not too different. And again, I think we've said most of all of this, so I'll just skip ahead. All right. Well, this GM over I is a very useful metric for design. <clears throat> and if we were using a, a square law device, you would say, oh, GM over I, that's no nothing but 2 over VD sat, right? But clearly, we're not going to use a square law device. So instead of using VD sat, what we're just going to do is we're going to call the denominator V star. Okay? And uh, this is something that Professor Bozer came up with. The reason being that there was so much confusion. You know, some people were using VD sat, some people were not. So you just call it something else, and then it's clear that you're not talking about VD sat. So V star is not VD sat, but it kind of is. Okay? And, and you'll get a feel for that throughout the class. But V star is actually something very precise. You just go and you measure your GM over I of the device, and from there you calculate V star. Okay? And so V star is really like a design parameter. Why do we use V star? Well, it's going to become clear uh, as we go forward, but overwhelming reason for using V star is that a lot of design criteria come down to selection of V star. In fact, before we go on, let's just see how many parameters do we already know are related to V star? If you don't know V star, think of VD sat, right? What does VD sat determine for, uh, let's say, an amplifier? Okay, you use the mic. Swing. That's right, right? Swing. So if, if you have a transistor, you know that it's going to prevent it from going to triode. You have to keep it active. You have to be above VD sat. Well, VD sat again, square law concept, but V star should be close. So the bigger I pick V star, the less swing I'm going to have. 
right? And remember, a lot of what we do in this class is about dynamic range. Every transistor has noise, and so swing over noise, right, is kind of an important metric. That's the dynamic range. So swing goes uh, inversely proportional to V star, right? Not inversely exactly, but, you know, qualitatively. Well, what about noise? Well, we'll come back to noise uh, next week, but we'll find that actually in many circuits the opposite applies, that higher values of V star give us lower noise. Not universally true, but right away you see you have a, a conflict of interest, that picking the right value of V star is going to optimize performance. Okay, so I'm not going to say much about the large signal charge model. and. Uh, the reason is there's just not enough time. Actually, it would be a fun discussion to have. I'm going to encourage you guys, if you're interested, to, to read Savitas' book. He has a really nice discussion of large signal properties of a transistor, in particular the dynamic characteristics. Uh, what we're going to do here is basically just point out a couple of things. First of all, you know, we, we want a small signal model for a transistor. And so you would say, how many capacitors do I need in my small signal model? Right. Anybody have a guess? Think of, it, think of it systematically, right? I have four terminals on my device, right? And I could say the charge at each terminal should be a linear function of the rate, you know, change of every other terminal, right? So systematically I should have four times four, right? Sixteen. <coughs> I say actually, actually not quite right. Um, you don't need 16 parameters because that overspecifies the problem. You can use charge conservation and, and uh, basically reduce that down. At the end of the day, you only need nine unique. You only have nine unique capacitors. So if you put together a small signal model, there should be nine capacitors in that model. How many of you guys have ever used the small signal model with nine capacitors, right? We just don't do it. It's too complicated. But SPICE is doing it, right? And so a lot of times when you see a discrepancy between your calculations and SPICE, it's partly some of these capacitors, which we think aren't important, which turn out to be important. So I encourage you guys to be aware of these capacitors. Go and plot them with the simulator and get to know them. But don't expect to understand everything that, that happens from SPICE. Uh, in fact, we can have some, probably later in the course, we'll, we'll look at some examples where there's a big discrepancy between SPICE and classical calculations and actually pin it down to some of these transcapacitances. Okay? The other important point to, uh, to point out is uh, the way that uh, I've written the capacitance in this slide is the way SPECTRE defines the capacitance. Okay? Most people don't define the capacitance in this way. Most people put a negative sign in front of it. Okay? If you define capacitance this way, you get a negative capacitance a lot of times, um, except for self-capacitance at each node. And so if you plot capacitance in SPECTRE and you see a lot of negative numbers, it doesn't mean that the model screwed up. It means that actually these capacitances are supposed to be negative if you define them this way. Okay? The other important point is that these capacitances are not always uh, symmetric. In other words, the capacitance Cij is not equal to Cji. This one takes a little bit more thinking. Certainly in linear circuits, you know that they always are equal, right? But this is a nonlinear circuit, and uh, classic example is like a device in saturation, right? If I have, look at the effect of in, increasing the gate voltage on the drain versus increasing the drain voltage effect on the gate. If I assume I'm in saturation and I assume that channel length modulation and short channel effects aren't that important, right? Take that as a as a given. Then ideally the get, the drain is isolated from the channel, right? It has no effect on the channel inversion charge and therefore it has on, on, no effect on the gate charge. So if I look at the C drain to gate, um, you would expect there to be no correlation. So let me write this down so I get the signs right. So C drain to gate is the change in the drain charge 
as I change the gate voltage. C gate to drain is the change in the gate charge as I change the drain voltage. Okay. So this term is ideally equal to zero in saturation. Yeah, yeah, so we're talking about the intrinsic transistor, right? Spell it out. So for the intrinsic transistor, we're going to neglect this overlap, right? And call that the ex extrinsic part. So if I'm in saturation, then if I change this voltage, it doesn't influence this, this gate charge, and so there's negligible effect. Now, if you really want to be technical, you could say, yeah, if you change this voltage, it will change the depletion region a little bit, right? And that will change the amount of inversion charge a little bit. So you should see a small change in the gate voltage, but it's small. Okay. If you take Dibble into consideration, then, in fact, changing the drain voltage changes the threshold of the device and then there's lots of response right so this is no dibble on the other hand if we look at the change in the gate voltage that has a big impact on the amount of inversion and again for reasons of lack of time I can't explain this but the inversion charge well I can give you a quick explanation is partitioned into what we call the drain charge and the source charge, right? I'll explain why in a moment. But once you establish this partitioning that the drain actually is responsible for some of this inversion charge, then if I do change the gate voltage, I will see a change in the drain charge. And so then this is not equal to zero. Okay? Now, let me first put this out to you guys and see if somebody has a good explanation of charge partition. Why is it that the inversion charge is not all belonging to the source? Right? I mean, the channel is all connected to the source, right? So why isn't all the inversion charge just part of the source? Anybody? Give you guys a hint. Think of the dynamics. Think of the dynamics of the device. So if I were to change the gate voltage and therefore change the level of inversion in the channel, where does where do those charges come from? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Well, yeah, I, th I think I heard somebody. The circulation of charge and drain the source and the conservation of charge implies that if you take the charge from the source, you have to give the charge from the drain to compensate. Okay, that, that's a nice way to look at it. Um, I think it's, it's equivalent to what I'm going to say. Another way to look at it is that you know, when, when the drain current and the source current are equal, right, there's a fixed amount of charge that's in the channel at any given time, right? Because they spend a finite amount of time in the channel. And that's the inversion charge, right? So the inversion charge is not really fixed, it's moving. Now, if I want to increase the amount of inversion in the channel, I have to increase the drain current relative to the source current because momentarily I have to pile electrons, let's say, or holes into the channel. So that means that the drain current and source current cannot be equal. And that change in that, that dynamic change in that drain current, actually the rate of change of the drain current charge, so I could say here that the drain current dynamic, there's a transport component to it. That's just the DC current flowing. And then there's the, this is the dynamic component. Because this dynamic component is non-zero, there has to be drain charge associated with changing the inversion charge. Okay, So this is the one minute intuitive explanation. If that piques your interest, certainly go read uh, Savitas' book. There's a whole chapter on this. What is IT anyway? <laughs>
IT is the transport current, so it's the DC current. So we're talking about the, the charging currents necessary when you change the amount of inversion of the device. Okay, so uh, it's a deviation or distraction. Let's get back on schedule. Okay, so again, we're not going to deal with all these capacitors. We're, we're going to use models that you guys are pretty familiar with. And uh, there are some weaknesses, and we'll point out those weaknesses as, as we encounter them. But all you guys know how to calculate capacitances in, in a transistor. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this course. I'm not going to bother going through these slides. Um, yeah, you guys know how to do this. Uh, one thing that, that I will mention, maybe you haven't seen this before, is how the layout of the transistor will affect uh, the amount of junction capacitance that you have. And this is the so-called fingering or folding of a transistor. So here on the top layout, you have a certain W, and you ca calculate your source drain areas and perimeters. So the, the area of the source drain is basically, you know, for, let's say for this technology, it's one micron. Uh, for ours, it's probably closer to half a micron. Uh, so you take this dimension times this dimension and multiply it by the junction capacitance, right? And for the perimeter, it's basically this perimeter. Don't include inside of the gate. Only include these three sides. Why is it that we don't include inside of the gate when calculating the perimeter? Yes. There's no stop implant, as there is on the outside? Yeah, it has to do with the way we dope our device. So the when people give you the capacitance per unit length, it actually is for the doping that's around the device, not on the inside of the device. The inside of the device, the doping is different. So it's an approximation, but uh, that's already built into the number that you get. So if you want to get the correct value, do yourself a favor and don't include the gate side, otherwise you get too much capacitance. Well. That's fine, but what if I finger the device? What changes? Well, by fingering the device, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put devices, I'm going to share junctions, as I've shown here, and then I'm going to use my metal layers to actually connect up the drains and the sources. So on this particular layout, I'm using a shared junction for the drain, and I'm using two separate junctions for the sources. So this mi middle junction here is actually the drain of two devices. And so the capacitance there gets divided by half. Well, that's great because the drain is where I care about capacitance, right? That's where the uh, where the high impedance node is likely to be in, a, in an amplifier. So that's the point I want to choose as my drain, not the outside, right? And then also you can see the perimeter is smaller on the inside. The perimeter now is just two times the small value rather than two times the small value plus W. So this is actually, if you work, it, work out the numbers, it's a huge saving. So here, for instance, the total capacitance is 28 femtofarad. Here, I get 29 for the source side, but only 10 for the drain side. Right? So almost a factor of three reduction in capacitance with layout. OK, so keep that in mind when you're doing the project that uh, you, don't, you can actually benefit from using multiple fingers. Okay, again, I'll skip these details and you know how to do this. Okay, so how about some frequent, uh, high frequency figures of merit? Okay, you guys are all familiar with omega t. Omega t of the device is the unity gain, unity current gain frequency, right? So what I'm going to do is, how do I define omega t? Let's remind ourselves. So to find omega t, what I do is I drive my device with a signal source i in, and I measure i out over i in. Okay? And so VGS of the device is 1 over j omega CGS times i in. i out is approximately GM VGS, and if you want to also include the overlap capacitance, then you should add this, so let's call that CGS prime. And so the output current is GM over J omega CGS prime, and this is the current gain. 
And if I take the magnitude of this, it's just GM over omega CGS prime. And I find the frequency where this is equal to 1, that's omega T. Right? So you guys have all seen this before. It's kind of interesting that this quantity, omega T, plays such an important role, right? I mean, we, we hardly ever use this as a current in this configuration, right? Hardly ever have a short circuit at the output. Uh, but omega T nevertheless plays a very important role for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of high frequency poles in a circuit end up, or poles and zeros, end up being uh, some fraction of omega T. And so it's very important to know what the omega T of the device is because those high frequency poles limit how much gain we can get at lower frequencies. They're going to basically determine how we compensate our amplifier. Okay. So if I plug in just uh, physical values from a long channel transistor model, granted it's a long channel transistor model, uh, then I know my GM is proportional to uh, basically mu C ox W over L VGST, right? And I know CGS is proportional to C ox times W L, so the W's cancel out. I get an L squared relationship here. And I get a very important equation which tells me the omega t of the transistor is given by one, the mobility. The higher the mobility, the better. Two, VD sat. Hey, you control that. Great. You have a knob to turn. And three, the L of the device, right? Again, this is a long channel equation, but still gives us intuition. It tells us that shorter channel links definitely have better omega t's, and higher VD sats also have bigger omega t's. So another way to to uh, write this equation, you can actually interpret this term here as being 1 over the transit time in the transistor. So this is 3 halves 1 over the transit time, or the, the average time it takes for a carrier to cross through the channel. Okay. If you think back to your bipolar days, then that's actually pretty nice because we had a similar equation for bipolar that the FT is in the limit, if we bias it correctly, basically 1 over the transit time, the base transit time. Well, this is all long, good, nice and good for long channel. What about short channel transistors? Well, if you take the degenerate short channel transistor, degenerate short channel transistor means assume all the current is flowing at velocity saturated limit. Uh, then you get that the omega t of the device is very simple. Uh, it's just 3 halves times, again, 1 over the transit time. Transit time now is just L over V sat, right? Because everyone's traveling at that speed. And so now you could see that the omega t only improves like 1 over L, not like 1 over L squared. Well, the real device is not quite a degenerate velocity saturated device, so in reality, it's going to be between L and L squared. So if you, in fact, if you go and plot different generations of devices with different speeds, you'll find that initially the slope will fit omega squared, and now it's actually between omega and omega squared. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes. How does that come into the picture? Well, we plotted the GM over I before, uh, and then repeated them here. Now we can plot the VT, uh, uh, omega t, as a function of VGS, right? VGST, because we know that the higher value of VGST, the, the more, the higher the performance, at least in strong inversion. And so here's the the plots for the NMOS and PMOS device, and you can see now very clearly that operating in this region is is very very detrimental to speed, right? And in fact, a good figure of merit would be to multiply this curve by this curve, because it would give us the trade-off between speed and gain per current, right? Current being very important because that determines the power consumption of our circuits. So just very quickly, why is it that the omega t is so bad in weak inversion? Uh, there's not enough time here to derive this equation, but at the end of the day, uh, your equation looks something like this. And the omega t Again, it's proportional to mu, just like before, but instead of being proportional to VD sat, very nicely, it's proportional to KT over Q. So if your VD sat is 250 millivolts and your KT over Q is 25 millivolts, right off the bat, you're at least a factor of 10 lower speed, right? Then there's this ratio, which is the current that you're operating with divided by the maximum current that you could operate at and still remain in 
reconversion. So clearly this ratio is also going to be less than 1, and so you can see that reconversion, just by definition, is going to have a much lower omega t. And this is kind of borne out here by the simulation, which shows that the omega t drops dramatically as you go into weak inversion. Okay, any questions? See you next week.